Hello and welcome everyone to this Teach Meet. This event is part of the Accelerate Your Teaching MOOC, Research Facilities to Support STEM Education. My name is Mihalina, and together with my colleagues Miriam and Diego, we would like to thank you for joining us. Before I pass the floor to our speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. First, please make sure your sound is turned on. Uh, we would like to remind you that during this webinar, your cameras and microphones are off. Secondly, if you have any questions, you are invited to write, write them here in the chat and we will address them in the end. This webinar is recorded and we will publish it in the course. So you can also watch it later again if you wish. We'll, you will also have access to all the slides and the links shared during this webinar. And now I would like to welcome our speakers, Marina, Diana, Anna, Mia, Cristina, and Tabea. And without any further ado, I would like to pass the floor um, to speakers. First, please welcome Marina, who apart from being uh, one of the speakers today, she's also the uh, MOOC moderator. Um, she will have around 10 minutes, and then each speaker will have five minutes to present. Marina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Michalina. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Stitch Meet. I am very happy to be here with you today. Um, my name is uh, Marina Tomara. I am a science teacher. I live and uh, teach in Greece. And uh, for a few months now, I'm also the head of uh, Kuvaras High School, which is in the eastern suburbs of Athens, Greece. Actually, you can see here a picture of my school's location. Um, uh, so, um, I have the pleasure to be the moderator of this MOOC, and I also belong to the worldwide community of scientific ambassadors. Also, I'm a research associate uh, at the University of Athens, and uh, basically my field of research is uh, immersive technologies for learning purposes. So, I hope you're enjoying this MOOC. Uh, for me, uh, it was a great opportunity to be able to have access to such a great collection of um, rich and diverse and up-to-date material and resources about particle physics and uh, accelerators. I believe it is a um, topic that is very interesting and students should know about it because actually I think it's the science of tomorrow. I hope you're feeling the same way about this. Um, so already some of you have completed uh, your assignments. Congratulations. Uh, for those still working on your scenarios, um, uh, since not all of you are uh, science teachers or physics teachers, uh, I would uh, encourage you to offer your pers perspective um, while approaching the topic in your scenarios uh, based on your background, on your own background, whether it is uh, music or language uh, so uh, be inspired by the MOOCs resources and uh, try to be creative. Um, so just keep in mind that uh, you shouldn't, uh, you'd rather not leave the scenario submission for the last day because you also have the peer assessment, uh, the three peer assessments uh, in order to uh, complete uh, the activities, the assignment and get the certificate. Uh, so uh, good luck with your scenarios. And uh, now we're moving on. So uh, for the next minutes, we will see an example of uh, how we can benefit from using augmented reality technology for learning purposes, and in particular for teaching physics concepts. Um, I guess uh, all of us have more or less some experience with augmented reality learning applications. Um, Accelerate AR introduced to us during this MOOC uh, was a, a very good example, but the, I, I'm sure that uh, you know you have you have used probably or seen others as well. Um, so here are a few pictures taken uh, from uh, my, cl my classroom with students experimenting uh, with augmented reality. And uh, since atoms and charges are in the heart of this MOOC, I chose to share with you an augmented reality app that I have developed during my PhD research. And its uh, main learning objective is uh, actually to teach the forces between uh, static electric charges. So um, a little theory here. Uh, we have two electric charges that are opposite. These uh, charges attract. 
and we are also having um, a, a, a like charges which repel and this is due to the electric force that appears between them and of course there is also a mathematical formula that describes uh, the relation between uh, of the force uh, I, I, the magnitude of the force uh, relative to the size of the charges and the distance uh, between them. And this formula, you will see it later in the app. Um, so the idea is this. Uh, we are using two simple pieces of paper, uh, two paper cards, uh, which will serve as the physical objects. And uh, we need a device, um, maybe a, a, a tablet or a mobile phone or even uh, proper glasses, uh, through which we will see the charges on top of the cards. So this is ba basically what augmented reality implements. Um, so next, uh, we will watch a video to see how the app works. As soon as the camera points to the cards, the app overlays the electric charges and forces on top of the cards. The students can then move around the charges and observe the changes in the forces size and direction as they change the distance and relative position between the charges by moving the cards around. The simple menu allows the user to change the charge size. The students can enter various numeric values for the charge size in the field. This action is followed by a visual change in the size of the augmented charges and allows students to observe the subsequent changes in the force's magnitude. The user can also change the charges type in order to observe the attractive or repulsive forces in each case. Also, we can see that the distance in the force formula corresponds to the real distance between the electric charges. So this was the video. Um, what I think is worth noticing here uh, in relation to what you may have already experienced with other augmented reality apps is that there is a continuous real-time interaction between the user and the digital data. Uh, that is, the forces are changing continuously, uh, responding to the change in orientation of the cards. And this is happening in real time, and it's continuous. And of course, this has been quite demanding in technical terms. And there is also math in the programming of the app. But I think this is what makes it a real 3D simulation. And I think this is a, a real hands-on learning activity. So based on what we saw, let's think for a moment what it is that we can achieve with augmented reality in physics learning that we cannot do otherwise, probably with a 2D simulation. So I mean, what is the added value of augmented reality? Um, first of all, with augmented reality, it, it, I think it was obvious, we are able to see the invisible. And uh, we can do that in 3D, um, like uh, the electric forces between the charges. Um, and I think this is ideal for representing vector quantities, which uh, students find hard to grasp in physics. Uh, also, we can observe the real-time space and time evolution of phenomena, which, as I said before, is not so widely adopted, probably due to technical difficulties. But I think it's, it, it wor it's worth doing uh, because um, it gives this uh, real-time uh, evolution of phenomena, which is really important for physics. Uh, and also, it's important to, to visualize phenomena that happen at too small or too large scales. Uh, that cannot be observed otherwise, like uh, the interaction between electric charges. Uh, what's more, this approach uses modern technology that children are particularly fond of and which uh, has other benefits as well uh, with, uh, regarding uh, inquiry-based uh, learning. Uh, also, it can be used inside the classroom. It's inexpensive. There's no need for special equipment. And uh, due, to all of the, due to all this, and if properly implemented, I think that augmented reality technology 
has the potential to provide engaging, hands-on, collaborative, self-paced, inquiry-based learning. From my experience, uh, having, uh, having uh, implemented this uh, with my students for three years in a row, I would say that um, it is very effective in terms of motivation and engagement, at least. So uh, for those who are interested in uh, downloading and trying the app uh, together with others, here is the link. Unfortunately, it is in Greek, but um, I promise to have the English version in about uh, 50 day, 15 days. And a link to the video on YouTube, my email, in case uh, someone would like to ask for help regarding the apps or has uh, some thoughts or comments. Um, so this was my presentation. I hope you liked it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and here now is uh, Diana. Diana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. So this is a very big topic, so I'll, I'm running out. This is my full name, and my background research, and my email, and the topic is identification of SARS. SARS CoV2 proteins with synchrotron like source. Um, well, a synchrotron is a type of circular particle accelerator that produces the intense beam of light more than a million times brighter than the sun. We have here a graphic in, in which the fourth generation synchrotron, which is the object synchrotron, is compared to the sun. Sun is 10 to 10 photons, and uh, this synchrotron is fourth generation is 10 to 22 photons. We have here the electron gun. They are shot to the LINAC, then are injected to the booster. It's a small ring. They are rotating until they almost they reach the speed of light. Then are sent into a storage ring, which is the biggest ring, and then go to a beam line. The beam line is a laboratory, and they would pick, um, they select a wavelength that go from infrared to X-ray. Okay, there are more than 15, 50 light sources around the world we have here from light sources. Well, the technique is very important because we have here a protein data bank. They have too many structures uh, around the world, but uh, they give from a synchrotron goes uh, to 80% of structures and half of it goes from the European synchrotron radiation facility. X-ray diffraction is the only technique that goes from a synchrotron. There's no other technique that can give us a result in few days and with a very clean uh, picture. We can also have the identification and main protein was on 2019 um, from China, but this is a picture from a diamond light source. We have the virus, we have the spike protein, which made the, the whole cell, um, the binding between whole cell and uh, virus. As we can see here, this, this small piece was uh, taken from this. This is the atomic model. We can see the the user from the synchrotron like source. We have here 600 samples, then a robotic arm. We can also have a, a gas, a cool gas that is nitrogen. We can also see this point on green is uh, the sample. We can also have uh, an X-ray beam. And this camera is taking too many pictures of, of this uh, little piece of sample. From 10 to 13, the user needs to make a very complex uh, iterations uh, that took, in this case, took two days. So uh, let's get a let's get a wow to to the user. And then we have also the timeline of some synchrotron facilities because they all open the doors to the research against Corona. We have we have also here on December China the synchrotron in China. Uh, diamond like source, they both found the main protease that is this small piece from uh, spike protein. Uh, on April 2020 in Spain, they studied the protein membrane and spike. We have here the, the picture. On May, Mexican synchrotron has an agreement with the uh, Red. So Mexican researchers went to Switzerland to study messenger RNA from the virus. We can also have on December, the first vaccine comes from Pfizer and BioNTech. They were helped by TESI in Germany. And we, are, we have also the Medicine Nobel Prize from this year, Catalin Carico, which was in this amazing um, 
BioNTech uh, enterprise. On December 21, we have uh, Max4 in Sweden that identified the non-structural protein 10, number 10. This is uh, Max4, and this is the protein. Uh, well, synchrotron in STEM is very important. So you guys, if you are in Europe, please feel passionate so your students can feel passionate uh, also because it's very important to, to the use of particle oscillators. I'm so far of you and I'm so excited with this topic. Uh, please use social media. You can go to Instagram, Facebook and follow your particle oscillator page and interact with them. They have two main information. Also take a, a, a Nordic particle oscillator project mark. It's amazing. I took it on Coursera. And also remember that history needs science. There are too many guys that love uh, history and arts, and it's amazing. But if we can convince them to to be a scientist, to become a scientist, they can also study arts, as in the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, they are studying the, this painting oil, and they found too many things that they weren't found uh, before. We can, we can also have the subscribers go to lightsources.org and International Agency of Energy or Atomic Energy and go to Open Day. If you are near, or near of a facility, go to an Open Day with your students or you can also have a virtual tour. I think uh, almost all synchrotrons have a virtual tour on their, uh, on their pages. Uh, those are my references. Um, Shambhai, like a synchrotron light source. Thank you. I don't know who is next. <laughs> Anna, the floor is yours now. Okay, I thought Diana was uh, before me. Okay, thank you very much for this invitation to be here again. Nice to see you. Congratulations for very, very uh, well organized this Teach Me. And uh, my name is Anna Magiosi. Um, principal of um, Rosario Kita Garden. Uh, give me one minute. Okay. Okay. Um, awarded Chinese the Global Ambassador. Okay, I have uh, many titles. I didn't uh, read all this. Uh, I will um, spend more time to present uh, my school. Uh, my school is a small kita garden uh, in the, located in the center of Greece, but we try to offer our students uh, equal opportunities for a quality education. And any kind of innovation has been integrated into daily program of our kita garden and is being applied with excellent results. Kita Garden of Rosario is one of the first training schools of Europe, and also we are experts team school Code Week School, Silver Safety School, and awarding winning school in education leader awards competition of Greece to ICE in the field of innovation of education. And also this year we gained the European Prize of Innovation Teaching 2023, eight um, uh, prizes for Erasmus Key Action to Project Learning is interesting and fun. Um, <laughs> very short presentation. And uh, next uh, slide is, um, oops, here, okay. Uh, our theme, our topic, uh, STEAM, uh, sorry, uh, is STEAM pro uh, project, the trip to our galaxy, because uh, pres our presentation uh, have uh, title STEM uh, and our solar system, a trip to our galaxy. Uh, motivation. Space and galaxy is a subject that uh, fascinates children and arouses their interest. interest. Uh, wanted to learn more, we included it in the lab skill of daily program of our school and we, are ready, we, we were ready for uh, our beautiful adventure to their neighborhood of sun. If you see, we send the flag of our school in the moon. Okay. Uh, lesson names. Uh, we wanted with this uh, learning scenario project to learn uh, all children, the planets uh, of the solar system, uh, what happened there, to learn the orbits of the planets around the sun, to understand the alternation of day and life, to get the knowledge of some characteristic, characteristics of Earth, like uh, spherical shape, uh, gravity, conditions of life, 
to learn about the job and uh, the life of astronauts, connection with STEAM careers here, to become familiar with technologies, robotics, and program programming in a playful way, to develop the digital skills and digital and media uh, literacy. And of course, to develop all um, skills and uh, abilities of 21st uh, century. Um, and if you see in the question, what do you know about, about the aliens? You can see the beautiful market uh, that's made uh, uh, by our children. About activities now, first we started with diagnostic evaluation. We explored the children uh, um, previous uh, uh, knowledge about Earth and space uh, through online questionnaires, uh, drawing, watching videos and discussion of the topic. Uh, based on the principles in, of inquiring learning methods, students were asked to think and find answers to questions about space and the fact that the planets are not uh, isolated from each other, but uh, interdependent. Children learn about the moon, the earth and the sun through their active participation in many, many experiments and uh, a lot of games, of course, because we are kindergarten, as I told you before. And... Um, the benefits of this uh, learning scenario after the evaluation, we found out uh, that uh, um, children learn about solar system, understand what happened there. Um, we traveled to a mystery of the galaxy. Uh, so they understand the, the alternation of day and uh, night, uh, took part in simple experiments for their age. Uh, and they came in contact with the real life astronauts, you see later in, in one minute in the slides, and the concepts of coding and mathematics, uh, literacy exercises, uh, cultivating critical uh, thinking, collaboration, creativity, modeling, computational thinking, digital and uh, media literacy, connection with uh, potential STEAM uh, careers. But uh, first of all, they enjoy every activity. So, uh, just uh, three slides to, to see <laughs> some pictures. Uh, you can see the experiment with air, with balloon, uh, works like uh, a rocket, like a spaceship, when uh, we leave it without gloves. And the children play in the sun and the earth to understand uh, that uh, earth goes around of the sun. Here is a moon phases uh, with uh, two pieces of uh, um, of paper. Here is a magnet under the paper and we put the earth to go around the sun. Uh, another experiment here, very uh, known to it. Uh, we play with the vision uh, worksheets, 4D cards. We have a lot of them in our school. Uh, games and robotics, of course. We could leave robotics out of this and we could leave out, uh, leave out of this. Um, art because uh, non-stem activities is uh, connected with this theme and we can see theatrical play here uh, you can see beautiful paintings via computer um, and uh, here is the life of uh, astronauts we take part in uh, this uh, um, program train like an astronauts and we le we learn about the healthy food uh, in connection with uh, combination with solar system and we have uh, cooperation with ESA and NASA. Till now, we have three projects you can see here. Uh, I suggest to use uh, this uh, Stellarium, these two uh, uh, links, Stellarium and Celestia, because it's very nice uh, links and gives you, uh, you the opportunity to uh, travel to the space. And uh, thank you very much. Next. Uh, I don't know what happened. I, ca I can go, uh, I can move my slide. I don't know. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Please, uh, next uh, speaker um, is Mia. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you for inviting me on, the, on this event. Uh, my name is Mia Chukwuca and I'm a physics teacher at elementary school Tril and elementary school Petar Kružić in Klis, Croatia. 
I am also a member of the gifted team at my uh, elementary school, Tree, and also I'm participant uh, in many national and international projects and meetings. So today I'm going to speak, uh, speak about the albedo effect. So I will now show you what I have prepared. So first of all, what is the albedo effect? The albedo effect refers to the ability of a surface to reflect sunlight. So this effect plays an important role in regulating the Earth's temperature and climate. Surfaces with high albedo reflect more sunlight. And I need to mention that surfaces with high albedo are light surfaces. And also uh, surfaces with low albedo absorb more sunlight and they are uh, darker, uh, darker surfaces. So these uh, terms come from the Latin word albus, which means white, and the symbol for this is A. Values are zero and one. Zero is uh, low albedo and it's for black surfaces, and one is uh, high albedo and it's for lighter surfaces, uh, white surfaces. So the phenomenon city heat, uh, heat islands so city areas are much warmer than the areas uh, surrounding the city and most of the sun's radiation is absorbed and converted into the heat that is released into the atmosphere and raises the air temperature so here you can see the examples of uh, albedo values of different surfaces on the first uh, picture you can see the trees they have albedo uh, 0 0.15 to 0 0.18. And uh, next to this uh, picture, you have uh, asphalt, which has a very low albedo, 0 0.05. And uh, you can see this is a dark surface. That is the reason. Concrete, 0 0.25. Green grass, 0 0.25. Ice, 0 0.3 and fresh snow 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. Uh, so you can see uh, fresh snow has a very uh, high albedo, it's almost one. So I have prepared two experiments that you can do when I, uh, you are doing this uh, in your classroom. I need to mention that uh, these experiments are very cheap, you don't need any professional equipment. For the first experiment, this is the experiment with ice. You will need two papers, black and white sheet of paper of the same size, two ice cubes and the lamp. So uh, the procedure is next. You will need to put papers uh, one to the other and you will need to put the ice uh, cube on every paper and you will need to heat that. So you will heat it, uh, this until the ice completely melts. So I also made a video of this experiment, so you will now see the work results. So you can see that on black paper, ice melts faster than on the white paper. Here you have a worksheet if you want to do this experiment in your own cl uh, classroom, but this is on creation, but you can always translate it if you want to use it. I will put everything later in chat, these links, so that you can use in your classroom. Next experiment X, uh, is experiment with water, sugar and soil. So the procedure is next, you will need uh, three cups, same size, and you will put water, sugar and soil at the same height. So I uh, just need to mention that you will need to put black soil, so you will now see how it looks. Uh, at the beginning, you will, as you see, you have three cups here, and you will measure the temperature, initial temperature, and you will write that. After that, you will heat this for 10 minutes. And after heating, you will again see what is with the temperature. So on the results, you will see that the temperature is 
the highest at the black soil, and that is the reason because of the dark black surface. Okay, so uh, this is a question to think about. On a summer day, the sun is radiating strong and, and at the same time heating up the newly cultivated agricultural area by the sea. Will the cultivated soil or the sea warm up more during the day? So the answer is that the soil will heat up more than the sea. And the reason for higher heating is its dark surface and very low albedo. So conclusion is that we people can uh, change the albedo. We have abil the ability to re reduce the effect of thermal city islands. We can paint the roofs in white. We can paint uh, the buildings in white. We can put on our balconies some uh, plants, uh, trees. And also on the summer days, uh, we can wear a lighter color. So. Thank you very much on this opportunity. Uh, I hope so that you like my presentation. So if you give me, uh, if you can give me the feedback, it will be great for me. But uh, I will put everything, uh, everything in chat, so you will have links for everything. Thank you. And now the floor passes to. Christina, the floor is yes. yours. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Cristina de Vega Benavides. I'm from Spain and I work in um, Zeit Clemente Fernández de la Devesa in Medina del Campo. Um, and I'm going to talk about AR apps in the class. So many times it's a topic that it's important in the class. And as uh, Marina said at the beginning, it's something that we all have used, but let's focus a little bit more on that. So what are the benefits? Well, we have already said about understanding content better, spatial awareness, long-term memory retention, collaboration, increasing student motivation. So basically everything's great. However, we need to focus on which app and in which moment to use it, because many times we have so many that we just need to decide on one. I think that's a key question when we're working with our students. So let's go and talk about some of them. Sorry, some of the um, apps that we can use are there on that slide. So I bet you have heard of Merge Cube, which is an holographic cube that you can use with different apps in order to create different settings. Quiver Vision, which is also a simple app, but really cool to use, where you have to download a coloring page for your students that after you will scan with the app and create an augmented reality for themselves. Another part that you can also use is augmented reality visits to museums, to farms, to everywhere. And also, I don't know if you have heard of Plickers, which is an assessment application. All of those four seems great for primary education, which is my case, but I need to focus on what I want to do at every moment. Not all of them work all the time. And also, not always, at least that's my experience, we have the internet resources, sometimes internet goes down or the tablets do not work or the computer is not working at that moment. So we need to be able to swap our minds in order into what we want to use. For me, those are the four simple augmented reality apps that we can use and start bringing interest to this type of um, apps in the primary classroom. Some of the uh, activities that we can create are here and they have to do with a variety of topics. We can create activities related to the water cycle. That is a unit and a topic that we all study during primary. So why not bring the augmented reality so we can see what happens with water? Volcanoes is also a topic that is a study in social studies, in geology during primary. And it's a topic that kids love 
because of the explosion of what's going on in there. So using, for example, the Merge Cube for a volcano uh, augmented reality, we're able to see what's happening even inside the volcano. For me, history is really close to my heart because I really like history and sometimes we think it's just facts and information, which of course it's true, but why not use the augmented reality apps in order to see a sculpture or in order to see a monument that is far from us in where we are and we can see the details and we can focus on why did they use whatever colors to paint the sculpture or why didn't they use color or what type of architecture they're using. So why not, not only in science, but bring it to something else. And finally, graphs. For me, graphs are a topic that is really difficult for primary students to understand the two lines and the concept and idea of sharing information in two different areas. Augmented reality helps us to join those two concepts and it's like clicking in the mind of our students. So when it comes to augmented reality apps, choose maybe one or two that you want to use in your class. Don't go overboard. Sometimes we cannot do all of that, especially in primary education with younger kids. And then think outside the box. Yes, we can use it in science, we can use it in technology and things like that, but boom, history is there, mathematics, anything else comes into place. So why not? And as I have said, there's a variety of apps that you can use and they're easy to download. Thank you very much for staying with me and I pass the floor to Tabea. Thank you, Christina. Welcome to my STEM education. My uh, presentation titled Feel the Acceleration as framework for exploring subatomic forces through dance. I am Tabea, an independent learning coach and researcher. I discuss how integrated, sorry, integrated ideas into technical and logical frameworks align uh, content with competences and use arts and sports in education. The process is iterative, transitioning from heuristic, integrative and disciplinary stages towards practical application. Key in planning your scenarios is to keep the target audience and goals in mind. An initial inspiration can be misleading that happened to me. For example, for this um, STEM, I connected fission and fusion with dance. It was a great idea, but it turned out to be a reactor technology. And I wanted to do something about accelerators. Choosing an approach largely hinges on our initial position and desired learning outcomes. Many of us know problem-based learning, PBL, is ideal for tangible challenges, aiming for a solution or product, and it unifies various subjects via a common context. STEM or STEAM focuses on an initial concept or curiosity, fostering in-depth comprehension and personal significance through a collective narrative. The distinction between PBL's multidisciplinary procedure is highlighted in a task like fixing a car. While pondering the concept of acceleration and differentiating speed from velocity demonstrates an abstract question apt for the integrative STEAM approach. I created, created a fun activity, the Feel the Acceleration, for kids aged 8 to 11. We explore two big questions. One, what are things made of? And two, why is speed different from how fast we get somewhere? Each big question comes with a challenge. 
The first challenge comes from Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics, exploring an unsolved scientific puzzle. We explore current ideas about particles and fields, understanding that science involves play, trying things out and learning from errors. The second challenge relates to Newton's second law of motion forces, specifically the Lorentz force and how it links to acceleration. Here's a glimpse of my micro task matrix, which I have structured around specific skills and competencies. You'll notice various learner proficiency levels horizontally and different subject areas vertically. I select the appropriate level based on the learner's specific needs. And for the STEM subjects, the same here. We mimic particle movements in accelerators to facilitate learning. Using specific dance moves, we simulate how these particles behave in accelerators and their role in cancer treatment. Four unique dances form a unified choreography, demonstrating why some tasks suit cyclotrons and others linear accelerators or LINAC. All through dance, you can follow the sequence or start with a simpler LINAC dance or focus on a single one only, depending on your time and your purpose. This simple diagram depicts the two types of accelerators and their general motion. This is a real cyclotron, a bit outdated, but it illustrates the process very well. This is how I represent the deuterion moving towards the ox oxygen 18. In another choreography, I portray its motion in the opposite direction when we employ a hydrogen proton to propel it towards cancerous tissue during proton therapy. This is a Lina from the Europeana collection. And this is my dance for a LINAC in electron therapy. In the fourth dance, fewer dances appear at the end, symbolizing an electron colliding with tungsten tissue. As learners grasp these moves and understand circular motion, we can connect them to how accelerators change subatomic particles for cancer therapy. These movements and math are also seen in dance like circle dances resembling the deuterion's path in the cyclotron. We use the horo, for example, bridging industrial and cultural heritage. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, so again, I would like to um, thank you all for thank you all for presenting. Um, and uh, now it's basically time for the questions. Uh, so if you um, have any questions, please type them in the chat. We already have some questions in the chat, and uh, so I'll start um, basically asking them. And uh, let me check. So we had some questions. Um, also from the MOOC and the chat. So let's go with the chat. Um, first of all, a um, question from uh, Harry. He says, I'm a certified science teacher from Naples, a national awardee, and prefer to explore international practices with added responsibilities. How much is the possibility for this? Um, and how, how to collaborate, I guess, in an international way? So I thought that maybe uh, Marina and Anna, as you are the scientific ambassadors, you could tell us a bit more about it. Or yeah, or Tabea, if if you please free, feel free to go ahead. Well, yes. 
Um, I think that uh, by joining this uh, community of scientists ambassadors, I think this would be a very um, this would be a great uh, way to join uh, international um, to, to share uh, international ideas and uh, projects about science. Um, probably visiting the scientists website would be a good starting point for that. Um, I don't know, Anna. Do you perhaps you have any other ideas about it? Anna, could you turn on your microphone? <laughs> All problems are here again. <laughs> Sorry for this. So uh, I suggest uh, to. Uh, upload our uh, work, good practices in um, uh, science uh, uh, digest. Uh, also, um, uh, they can take part like us and share their work with us in the MOOCs, during the MOOCs, um, and cooperate uh, with all uh, us, uh, the science ambassador. We are open in every co cooperation, I think. But uh, don't forget, I am in kindergarten. Of course, uh, I can work with this age. Um, but this, in this MOOC, I'm trying to to take this uh, challenge to uh, make a lesson for this MOOC. Okay, understand this uh, from 12 years old to 19. But uh, I will make a scenario for my uh, students. And I think the scenario that I present is also good for this MOOC. What do you think, uh, Michalina? <laughs> I think this is excellent, uh, yeah, uh, example of international um, collaboration. I'm open to, to, to every collaboration. If anyone wants to do it, I can help him or her, and uh, I, we can cooperate in everyone, everything with everyone. Exactly. And I think also you will have emails to the speakers from the slides that will be uploaded to the MOOC. Uh, and of course, there is a Facebook group. Uh, so please join. And uh, yeah, the, the community is there. Um, OK, so now maybe let's go for a question to Christina. So, well, there is a comment from Javier that the super useful Christina. Do you think these apps are inclusive and can be used with students who have special needs? Actually, yes. That was why I started using them. Some, it depends on the specific needs. Sometimes we need to be more focused on the instructions we give them. But as long as it's clear and it's very visual, it has worked in my case. I include everyone in, in that. Um, I have all sorts of students in the years that I teach, and most of them are inclusive. The Merge Cube especially, because it's completely visual. They don't need to, I mean, they if they want to, they can read in, for information, but they don't need to do any reading while using it. So that's another way to include them. And I like, um, again, the Merge Cube, you can put on the audio if the kids cannot read, but they can listen. So. Most of them are. Thank you for the question. Perfect. Thank you very much. Can, um, can so, I add something about this? Of course. Uh, uh, also in kindergarten works very, very well to use uh, Google Vision worksheets um, and uh, 4D cards because uh, everything uh, uh, um, come alive through these apps and children are very enthusiastic and they don't need to read something or that uh, uh, say before. And uh, it's great, it works very, very well for all children, all children. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, so now maybe um, I would like to ask Mia because there was a question regarding a specific heat capacity. So that the speak specific heat capacity affect the heating of surface? No, uh, so it's not directly related to the surface temperature, but uh, rather to the amount of, key, of heat uh, required to heat up the material. So uh, this doesn't mean its surface will automatically be hot or, hot or cold. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. 
Um, so then we also had uh, some questions from the MOOC and maybe Tabea or and Diana, you could uh, help with this one. So um, there is a comment that some, some of my students struggle with mathematic concepts and thus they are not sure how to motivate students to learn about accelerators. And I think you both had a lot of ideas how to do that. So maybe you could talk a bit about yeah, how to motivate students to learn about accelerators, especially mathematics. Tabea, could, could you start and then yes. we'll go for Diana. This is something I realized uh, at all ages with abstract topics uh, we are like not used to or people do not like very much to think rigorously and, and theoretically for some reason. So I try always to connect it to a practical experience. And that sounds very strange because we think it is an abstract topic. It's not something practical. But there is no abstract topic you cannot connect to a real experience. And for more than two years now, I'm totally fond about music. And um, this dance is something new also to use the body because we also, I see this trend that we use steam, like we use the STEM topics and then we make a drawing on it. This is not how I understand STEAM. This is not even how I understand STEM. Um, if we connect the mathematics to show that it helps us to make things work, which we like in engineering, like constructing something, but if we know the mathematics behind it, it's easier to build it. That this is something that kids can understand, but we have to design the, the topic in that way. And if it's even something we can emotionally connect, uh, then it's better. That This is really my passion to connect because I'm a, a real lover of mathematics. This is one of the few things that makes me crying. And <laughs> most people are the opposite. And I try to show that because there is so much beauty in that. And it's uh, it's in all life. It's really in everything. So yeah, get kids really passionate about it, and um, do not start with calculations. That comes at the end. Mm -hmm. Start with making them understand. Yeah, what uh, what the mathematics is behind it. Why we do this or why we do that. I, I also see that we have a lot of topics to learn, and we rush through a lot of formula. We do not really understand. I totally agree, uh, <laughs> and uh, I also have to say that I perceive the magic the same way. So I'm yeah glad to hear that. And um, maybe now, Diana, do you have anything to add from your experience? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I will tell my students uh, they they are good at mathematics because sometimes it's uh, about the mental issues that um, oh I'm not good and I prefer some other things and. It's the only thing I think uh, if they think that they can do it, they can do it because I teach in India and I, I'm not coming and teach them that, oh, oh my God, this is so hard. No, they can do too many complex mathematics, but uh, this is the first. The second, I would recommend uh, sometimes music uh, is very important. Um, for instance, uh, well, I'm in Mexico and banda sounds, uh, reggaeton and all that is, is kind of disturbing, uh, absorb mental and it has mental issues. Sometimes uh, you can, I put to my students a little bit of Mozart maybe, Vivaldi, all this kind of classical music and uh, the rest uh, it's my, this is my compliment for the, um, for Tabea. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, so I also had some questions. For example, uh, from less maybe STEM subjects, but um, how to also include, you know, th these topics in English, for example. So I don't know if one of you uh, would like to answer the question that says, how would you teach, how would you bring these topics to 14 years old in English class? Uh, because they struggle with basically creating a learning scenario about it. Uh, Tabea. Uh, in my scenario, I have already integrated that. Uh, I always do that. Um, it's not necessarily for English. You can use it for any language. But uh, the key is that for these processes in the cyclotron, we need 
certain um, letters. At the higher level, you can make that more complicated. At the three uh, K three level, I just use a few ones like the E for electron. And you can, um, the problem we have in cancer is that the DNA is broken, which are letters which are not in order. So this is where I start. And I, I show them some words which are in order, some words which are a little bit disordered. So we can still understand what it means. This is like cell mutation. And then we have really disordered words. You do not understand anything about it. You cannot have even an idea what it could be. That is cancer. So you can actually use um, a task in language to show there are certain things you can do misspell, but we still understand it. And there is a verse misspelling and we do not understand you. And that happens in other fields that connects. And then you can uh, use it as a task for uh, in English. We have always spelling issues, <laughs> for example, to train spelling. That's one example. Perfect. Thank you very much. It's a really good idea and I hope it helps with creating the learning scenario. Uh, and I think we have five minutes left, so maybe time for one more question. Um, and we had questions about uh, more about uh, uh, the AR. So basically, from which age do you recommend using AR? So Marina, maybe you could, uh, and Christina, if you could help with that, that question. Yes, of course. Um... Although I'm a secondary school teacher, um, so I don't have uh, much experience with primary school, I would say primary school students are very well suitable for uh, augmented reality. Because I think the greatest benefit of augmented reality is that it, uh, it gives life to everything. It's, uh, it's 3D and it's there. It's in your own room. It's in your own space. So mm -hmm. I think it's suitable for... All ages. It has to do with uh, how you use it, actually, as yeah. Diana said. I agree with, with you, Marina. Actually, we start using it with the five-year-old kids, mainly the ones that are very visual. And then, as you have said, pick the right one. I, at the beginning, it might be a bit difficult to choose what you need, but start with a topic that is simple or very interested, interesting for you and go for it. If it's visual, it works exactly. and it's there in the class and it's a way to travel over there, like Marina has said. So use it into your advantage. And I would like to end again that everything starts from kindergarten. Believe me, <laughs> we can teach everything in all lessons because we also have English in uh, kindergartens. So everything um, can pass to children through steam, th through uh, 3D, through um, playing, everything. But starts from kindergarten. Don't forget it. <laughs> I think uh, we have to. Um, all all kindergarten teachers, we have to work on it to give our children a lot of opportunities, uh, new ideas to work on it. I agree with you, Anna, fully. And I wanted to add uh, to Christina that um, I, I don't think you believe that, but just to make clear, it's not only for visual. We, we always think augmented reality is about visual, but that is the fascinating thing. Um, as soon as you can click a button, I think you can use that technology and you can also use it in an auditive way. So it can really help a kid, for example, to read a book in a different way or many, many, many things. And also is um, um, AI in kindergarten, all this, because technology is everywhere now. So we can teach also this. I, I couldn't agree with all of you more. And I would love to continue, but we're running short on time, so we slowly have to end it. Um, and yeah, so I would like you, thank you all for joining. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you will have access to recording of this webinar and also to the slides. Uh, the speaker has shirt and uh, they will be in the course. Uh, we hope that you have many great ideas to create your own learning scenario. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to submit it to the course, of course. Uh, and also thank you to our great speakers, uh, Marina, Diana, Anna, thank Mia, you. Christina and Tabea. Thank you, mm -hmm. everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for being here.
Bye. Bye. Nice bye. to see all you. Nice to meet Thank all you. you. Bye bye. Thank you for this opportunity, Thank you for the invitation. Kalina.